So I'm going to continue here um, where I left off in the previous video regarding uh, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi and his uh, alleged Zahirism. Okay, Az'amu, so I allege that he is a Zahiri. Adas, Shodkevich, Grill, Winkle, and Al Ghurab, the editor of uh, Futuhat al Makiyah from Dar Sadr, and he's also author of Al Fiqh and the Sheikh Al Akbar. And um, so all of them attribute to Ibn Arabi non madhhabism They argue that he is a mujtahid mutlaq. So he is a, a jurist of the highest capacity who uh, is able to essentially make his own madhhab, his own school of Islamic legal thought. Um, and they base their idea of non-medhabism on some lines of Ibn Arabi's poetry, um, which for me are far from explicit. They're, uh, uh, they don't really mean what I think people read into it. And I'll read it to you in translation, and I'll try to, try to put some Arabic on the screen here somewhere for you. I am not one of those who says, Ibn Hazm said, or Ahmed said, or Al Nu'man. And they have made me a disciple of Ibn Hazm. But I am not one of those who says, Ibn Hazm said. Nay, no. And neither am I one of those who invokes the authority of someone other than him. I profess the text of the book, such is my science. And so, uh, I'm going to give some commentary on this. Let's let's rehash this a little bit. I am not one of those who says Ibn Hazm said. In other words, Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi isn't just a mere narrator of Ibn Hazm. He's not going to say, well. Because I'm Vahiri, whatever Ibn Hazm said, that's what I'm going to follow blindly. Uh, in other words, what they call taqlid. Um, where you, you uh, conform or you follow the opinions of a greater juristic authority because you do not have the same juristic capacity. Okay. Uh, you know, for people who are not a lawyer, they're going to follow a lawyer blindly. They're going to take the lawyer's advice and perhaps blindly not knowing the details of the law and that's kind of what taqlid is more or less in Islamic law so I'm not one of those who said Ibn Hazm said or Ahmed meaning Ahmed Ibn Hanbal one of the founders of the four Islamic schools or al Nu'man, meaning Abu Hanifa that was one of his names Abu Hanifa so Nu'man was his real name Abu Hanifa was his kunya or his like nickname and they have made me a disciple of Ibn Hazm, but I am not one of those who says Ibn Hazm said. So here, people are alleging that Ibn Arabi, you know, is just a plain old Zahiri. And Ibn Arabi is saying, well, I don't make taqlid of Ibn Hazm. No, and neither am I one of those who invoke the authority of someone other than him. This could mean Allah or it could mean Ibn Hazm. But the next sentence, I profess the text of the book, such is my science, which indicates maybe that the him is referring to Allah there. So the above verses are about Ibn Arabi's refutation of blind imitation or taqlid of the schools of law and of specific jurists. So the Zahiri school is obviously way more than just Ibn Hazm. Ibn Arabi might be Zahiri, but decide not to follow Ibn Hazm on every single issue. And this actually is the classic Zahiri position. Zahiris always write polemics against taqlid. Okay. And so uh, Adam Sabra, whom I'm friends with, he has this uh, uh, article here, Ibn Hazm's Literalism, a Critique of Islamic Legal Theory. 
So if you take a look at that, yeah, I think he demonstrates pretty clearly that you know this rejection of taqlid is a mainstay. It's a uh, cornerstone, hallmark of vahiri thought. They reject all types of taqlid and they reject ijtihad and they're going to use their own juristic discretion interpreting texts literally from the al-kitab wa sunnah, the Qur'an and the hadith literature in other words. You can also take a look at Robert Gleave. He's got a book, Islam and Literalism, Literal Meaning and Interpretation in Islamic Legal Theory from Edinburgh University Press. And you can take a look at Goldseer's books uh, on Al-Vahiris. I think I might have both of those around here somewhere. So here is Islam and Literalism from Robert Gleave. Here is the Vahir Vahiritten ihr Lehrsystem und ihre Geschichte. Beitrag zur Geschichte der Mohammedischen, Mohammedanischen Theologie. So, von Ignaz Goldzier. So, we have uh, these books here where you can find more information about um, how the Vahiris rejected taqlid and this rejection of taqlid was something that goes way back to the original founding members of the Vahiri school of thought and it's also been well documented amongst Andalus Andalusian Vahiris so it's not just something from Ibn Hazm or one or two scholars it's pretty uh, a pretty common uh, hallmark of the Vahiri school in general So in my opinion, uh, these verses, which some uh, scholars say this means Ibn Arabi does not follow a madhab, for me are evi more evidence that Ibn Arabi is a Vahiri. So these verses of poetry are actually further evidence that Ibn Arabi was not a Vahiri in fiqh. The fact that Ibn Arabi does not blindly parrot Ibn Hazm does not mean that he is abandoning his hermeneutics, his usul fiqh, or his positive law, al, you know, furu' al-fiqh, okay? So on the contrary, Ibn Arabi almost always espouses vahiri legal theory and vahiri rulings. Moreover, it is not an automatic condition that a particular jurist agrees with every minute detail of his school in order to follow that school and be considered one of its adherents. It's exemplified by Abu Hanifa, whose two major students, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad Shaybani, disagreed with their teacher in both legal theory, usul al-fiqh, and positive law, furu' al-fiqh. Okay? So this is something that's very well known, you know, well known phenomena in Islamic law. And, you know, Ibn Arabi in his poetry says, I am not one of those who say. And when you look throughout the Futuhat at these different issues, you'll see uh, the way he formats it. He'll say, Qala Qawm. And it'll give the Hanafi position. Qala Qawm. It'll give the Maliki position. Qala Qawmun. It'll give the Shafi'i position. Qala Qawmun. Give the Hanbali position. And then uh, he'll say, Wabihi aqulu. And then he'll say, And in regards to that, I say, And then Ibn Arabi gives his own ijtihad, his own legal reasoning. So it, that verbiage ties directly to this poetry here. And, you know, furthermore, when we're talking about. Uh, uh, differences here and disagreeing with your own medheb. Um, you know, it's a well known thing in, in uh, uh, Islamic law that you have the concept of takhrij and tarjih, uh, where a jurist uh, who is a big uh, scholar, a big uh, jurisprudent in the school of Islamic legal thought, he can change some of the dominant rulings. Um, to fit their current times and circumstances, to fit new evidence or whatever, 
and uh, this is well known in the Shafi'i Madhab as well. You have, you know, Imam Shafi'i having his certain rulings. You have Ghazali who came later and has his certain rulings, and he reformulated, you know, Usul Fiqh for the Shafi'is. And then you have uh, Imam An Nawawi who came also An Nawawi or Nawawi who came and you know changed some of the rulings as well, talking about uh, the positive law there. And so. You know, Ibn Hazm himself is frequently known to have different op opinions than Abu Dawood al Zahiri, you know, the, you might say, founder or eponym of uh, the legal school of thought there, the Zahiri Madhab. And even Abu Dawood al Zahiri's son uh, had different opinions than his father, and Ibn Hazm disagreed with both of them sometimes. And uh, regardless of that, Ibn Hazm is still considered a very prominent Zahiri in the history of the Zahiri Madhab. And so he, he, even though he diverges from both of them in his Usul al-Fiqh, he's still considered a Zahiri. So for me, even if, the way I define a Madhab, even if Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi is disagreeing in Usul al-Fiqh slightly, or disagreeing in his furu al fiqh. So, if the legal theory and positive law is slightly different than Ibn Hazm or other Zahiris, that doesn't mean he is uh, a free thinker who follows no madhab. No, he, his hermeneutics, when you look at it, it's still 90, 99% Zahiri thought. Okay, and it's a Zahiri hermeneutics, it's a Zahiri epistemologies okay and um, he might tweak it a little bit but every Islamic scholar is idiosyncratic in their own way they have their own uh, eccentricities that their own uh, opinions on things they're not all blind followers otherwise they're not really a scholar now are they and so Ibn Arabi says in his section regarding usul fiqh blind imitation taqlid in the religion of God is not acceptable to us to us. So he's talking about a group. Neither the taqlid of someone alive nor dead. Moreover, he says in the section regarding tayammum, dry ablution using pure sand, our madhab regarding our saying that tayammum is not a substitute for ablution. Nay, it is archetypal specified legislated mashru'ah purification. It is not needed to make an analogy, qiyas, regarding that. It is not incumbent upon us, this qiyas, nor do we say by it. Our judgment, hukum, is only done with the text, nos, and we do not need qiyas. For indeed, the religion is already perfect, and you are not allowed to add to it. So here, this is classic Zahiri thought. There's a rejection of taqlid, and there is a rejection of qiyas, and there is firmly grounding things in the literal meaning of the text, not using human rationality, i.e. adding to the perfect religion of Islam. And so all of those are hallmarks, mainstays, cornerstones of the Zahiri madhab. Rejection of ijtihad, rejection of qiyas, rejection of taqlid. Okay. And then he uses all this verbiage throughout Al Futuhat al makiyah which I will demonstrate that we, our, and us. Ibn Arabi talks about himself in his legal opinions as if he belongs to a group, somebody more than just himself. And we know that many of his teachers were Maliki. We know that many of the Mu'atabirun were Maliki. Um, some of them were Zahiri. Um, so he's not referring to the Mu'atabirun. Um, he's referring to the Zahiri school. Okay. And the Zahiri school in Andalusia was alive and well during that time. Ibn Hazm wasn't an outlier. He wasn't someone who revived it from the dead ever since uh, the early period in Islam uh, there were people, Zahiris, transmitting 
Vahari Mevheb in Andalusia as part of the counter current subculture movements that existed there. It was always suppressed by the Maliki philosopher jurists. Um, it was not the status quo, it was suppressed by the status quo, but it still kept a chain of transmission. This tradition was being passed on from person to person to person to person without a break in that chain of transmission. So, you know, these things are import very important to keep in mind here. It must be remembered that Vahirism was in full swing before and after Ibn Hazm all the way up until Ibn Arabi. Ibn Hazm's Vahiri teachers and students are all well documented as are subsequent generations of Vahiris in Andalusia beyond Ibn Arabi's time. So you can look at a, a text here from Amr, Amr Osman, Vahiri Madhab third uh, century Hijri, ninth century Gregorian to 10th, 10th century Hijri, 16th century Gregorian. A textualist theory of Islamic law published with Brill, 2014. In addition, it's quite clear that they had an extensive social network. They were aware of each other and had connections with Vahiris in the Mashraq, in the Middle East, the Islamic East. So uh, these Vahiris were well connected to each other. They uh, did see themselves as a school there in Andalusia, and they also did identify themselves as part of the Vahiri school in the broader Islamic world. Okay. So this connection goes all the way back to Abu Dawood al Vahiri students who traveled to and settled in Andalusia. So Abu Dawood al Vahiri's direct students. Uh, settled in Andalusia. Thus it can be said that there was indeed a full thriving Vahari Medheb in Andalusia going back to the 10th century and extending at least till the 14th century. Although the Vahris were typically of small number in Andalusia and uh, marginalized even some political leaders such as Ibn Tumart and the Al Mohad Caliph Yusuf were public Vahiris. Okay. So, uh, you know, there's another academic, Jawad Qureshi, who uh, has also written on this topic and uh, agrees uh, that, you know, Ibn Arabi most likely was a Lahiri. Um, it's becoming quite clear with newer developments in the studies of Andalusian mysticism, Lahiri studies and Ibn Arabi studies, that, you know, uh, Ibn Arabi most likely was a Lahiri. It only benefits us to look at him that way, in my opinion. Um, because, you know, uh, like I said, you can have someone who is uh, part of a medheb but may disagree with certain aspects of it. And that's how I view Ibn Arabi in relation to the Vahri medheb. And I think uh, taking him out of the Vahri medheb is uh, ripping him out of context. It's nice to analyze his own thought in his own system uh, in its own uh, isolation. But we also have to keep in mind the context uh, in which this thought culminated, developed, uh, the intellectual milieu, how it was received, how people after it thought about it, how um, non vahris might have, uh, you know, received uh, this type of thought. Okay. And it also shows us who Ibn Arabi was connected to and who he was reading and who he was dealing with. And, you know, some argue, and I think it's a fair assessment that, you know, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi's fiqh did not have a major impact on the Vahiri school. I think uh, many of the Vahiris, uh, especially in the Mashraq and the Islamic East, were uh, in major disagreement with his theology. And, um, you know, I do think that Goldseer was quite correct labeling ibn Arabi as a Vahiri. And I don't think that Ibn Arabi can be understood out, outside of the context of Vahirism, and I don't think Vahirism itself can be understood without Ibn Arabi being a part of it. And so we have to, you know, put things in their proper context, I think, and I think it will shed more light on the, you know, Ibn Arabi's influence 
on the rest of the Islamic world, the uh, Islamic world's influence on Ibn Arabi, you know, vice versa. And I think this is a, a area of further study. Uh, this is something that, you know, someone could do a whole PhD dissertation on, uh, write a large book on. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. I'm just merely scratching the surface. Um, there's, uh, you know, some other people who've written on this as well. Um, so this is not a complete survey of all the literature that's out there on this. But I definitely think um, this re requires a lot more inquiry. And I'm going to show you some texts you know, some textual evidence here to back up what I'm saying. Also, just to give you an idea of what the Mu'atabirun movement is about, is, you know, just by looking at the structure of how Ibn Arabi talks about Islamic law, we will have a topic here. You know, وَصَلَّى فِي فَصْلِ تَرْتِيبِ الْجِنَائِزْ عِنْدَ الصَّلَاةِ Okay, or وَصَلَى maybe. And so it'll have some legal topic, and then it'll say, i'tibar, okay? And then it'll give um, some reflection upon that, maybe go into Sufi allegories of the law to bring you closer to Allah. So, an nisa mahalla taqween fahinna illa makawin, you know, and so on, so on, okay? So there's the i'tibar. Here we have another legal topic. Then i'tibar. We have another legal topic. Then وصل الاعتبار في هذه في هذا الفصل. Okay. So here's another legal topic, and we turn the page, and you know eventually we'll get to another اعتبار here. So we're we're it's a clear pattern. Okay. And this just gives you kind of an idea of these things that I've been talking about, um, you know, and the, uh, you know, if you look at my previous video on Sufi allegories of the law, um, you know, I talk about how it started with Al-Hakim at tirmidhi Imam Ghazali was another great expounder on the law, and then it culminates here with, uh, you know, Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, who we know read Al-Hakim at tirmidhi we know he likely read Ghazali. I'm very sure he mentions Ghazali in the Futuhat. And so he is the greatest expounder on the inner dimensions of Islamic law. They call Asrar al Sharia. Ah. And, you know, he uses the word I'tibar for Asrar al Sharia, ah, or for Sir, you know. Um, so that's just a, another characteristic here um, of Muhyiddin ibn Arabi that is uh, pretty unique to him. He's expounded on it much uh, greatly than other people. I apologize for my kids in the background. That's my beautiful daughter, Selma. So here's an example from uh, Al-Futuhat al makiya from volume number two. And here is a section on prayer on, you know, sujood, uh, sehu, which is where you forget how many units of prayer you're praying because you don't know which unit you're in and whether you've completed the prayer or not. You do an extra sujood at the end of the prayer. And here it says, اتفق العلماء على أن سجود السهو إنما هو للإمام وللمنفرد 
واختلفوا في المأموم يسهه هل عليه سجود أم لا فالجماعة أنه لا يسجد عليه ويحمل عنه, عنه الإمام الإمام وقال مكحول يسجد المأموم لسه لسهوه لسهوه وبه أقول فإنه ما رأينا أن الشارع فرق بين الإمام والمأموم حين ذكر سجود السهو وإنما ذكر مصلي خاصة ولم يخص حال من حال and so this is a passage for me is also indicative um, that Muhyiddin ibn Arabi is a Zahiri because he says the ulama agree that sujood as-sahu is only delineated uh, for the imam and the one who prays alone and uh, they disagree about the one who's following the imam who forgets, you know, is it upon him to pray sujood as-sahu or not? And he says, فَالْجَمَاعَةِ So most of the Muslims, most of the jurists, the fuqaha, they say that, no, he doesn't have to pray sujood as-sahu. Uh, that responsibility is carried by the imam, you know. And so he basically says, my opinion as Ibn Arabi, I'm saying that we do not hold the opinion that the lawgiver makes a distinction between the imam and the one who's led in prayer. Because when Allah mentioned sujood sahu he did not mention, you know, any particular prayer, musalli khasa. So, uh, you know, he did not delineate one state from the other, okay? And so this is using the Vahiri legal epistemology and applying it here. So he's saying that because it literally does not say in the Quran or there's no hadith here about it, uh, therefore this distinction is artificial. This distinction that, you know, the uh, four madhabs have made um, through Qiyas or different forms of Ijtihad we do not follow because us as Lahiris, we reject Ijtihad. And he says, Ra'ayna, it's our opinion. So here again, we have these pronouns like we, us, and our. And Ra'ayna, uh, that type of uh, terminology has been used ever since the oldest extant Islamic legal texts. This terminology, it's been used since the earliest uh, you know, times in Islamic legal history. Um, that's where you get the term Ahl Ra'i versus the Ahl Hadith. The Ahl Ra'i because they would say Ra'ayta, Ra'ayna, Ra'a. And so here it's that same language Ra'ayna anna shara'a farraqa bayna al-imam wal ma'mum. Okay. So we did not see or we do not hold the opinion that the lawgiver made a distinction between the imam and the one led by the imam, the follower, okay? So this for me is very clear and very indicative. This is volume two of the Dara Sadr edition, page 129 there. So, I mean, there are countless examples like this that we find with Muhyiddin ibn Arabi. So here's another example I wanna show you guys. It says, وَصَلَ فِي فَصْلِ وَقْتِ الصَّلَاةِ عَلَى الْجِنَازَةِ And so it says, قَالَ الْقَوْمْ لَا يُسَلِّي عَلَيْهَا فِي وَقْتِ مَنْ مَنْ هِي عَنَ الصَّلَاةِ فِيهِ وَقَالَ قَوْمْ And then it says again, وَقَالَ قَوْمْ And then it says again, you know, every time it says, فَقَالَ قَوْمْ فَقَالَ قَوْمٌ It's talking about one of the four madhabs. So this is a established opinion of one of the four madhabs. Each time he says that, and then he'll get to the bottom and he'll say, وَبِهِ أَقُولُ غَيْرَ أَنَّهُ لَا يَقْبِرُ فِي ثَلَاثَةْ سَاعَاتِ الْمَيِّتِ وَإِنَّ You know, 
ajzane. So here it's that we, that plural, again, as-salata alayhi fiha, and you know, the wurud an-nus, okay? So here again, it's talking about the textual reference that is typical with the Zahiri Madhab. And la nuqbira fiha, you know, mawtana wa hiya tulu'i wa gurub, you know, wa istawa, wa istiwa, okay? So... You know, this is also another uh, indication here that Ibn Arabi belongs to a separate madhab than the four canonical madhabs, and he keeps using na. He keeps using this we or us or our, you know, that uh, we constantly see throughout all of his legal writings. And just for reference, this is also volume 2, page 189 here. On page 188, which is Bab Thamin with Thamanun, so chapter 88, says, Fi ma'rifa asrar usul ahkam ashara. So, uh, gnosis of the allegories of the foundations of the rulings of. A shara. And shara is a, a interesting word in Arabic. Shara, it means um, revelation in the sense that it means the Quran and the Hadith literature, but it has the connotation of, you know, legality. It's the same root as sharia, a shara. But a shara is a little bit more holistic and uh, more encompassing than the word sharia. And it's usually a more abstract. And the highlighted part here in pink, it says, "A'lam anna, a'lam anna usul al-ahkami al-shari mutafaqun alayh, alayha thalathun al-kitab wa sunna al-mutawatira wa al-ijma' wa akhtalafu al-ulama fi al-qiyasi." فَمَنْ قَائِلْ بِأَنَّهُ دَلِيلٌ وَأَنَّهُ مِنْ أُصُولِ الْأَحْكَامِ وَمَنْ قَائِلْ بِمَنْعِهِ وَبِهِ يَقُولُ So here Muhyiddin ibn Arabiya, Shaykh al-Akbar, he's saying, know that the foundations of the rulings of the shara' are uh, are agreed upon on three aspects here. Al-Kitab, meaning the Qur'an, was sunnah al-mutawatira. And this is regarding uh, hadiths that have three chains of transmission, at least, or more. Some ulama disagree as to how many chains exactly they're supposed to be. But here, mutawatir, it means that there are so many uh, different narrators and so many different locations that they couldn't all have come together and conspired to lie about it. It's uh, a very high level of certainty that this is an authentic tradition from the Prophet Muhammad because it's mass reported. And um, then he says, well, and that's consensus. And then he says, the scholars, they disagree about Yes, or jurid, juridical analogy, and there are some who say that it is a piece of evidence. Analogy is a piece of evidence, and that it's from the foundations of rulings. Okay, it's from legal theory. Essentially, is what he's saying by usul ahkam. He means legal theory. And he says there are some who forbid it, and that is what I go by, or that is what I say. So here again, we have the vahri rejection of Qiyas. And Ibn Arabi, you know, I think in order to give himself authority here, Ibn Arabi is always giving the opinions of the different madhabs. He's showing you that he's mastered the four madhabs. He's transcended them. And so he himself is his own uh, mujtahid mutlaq, um, which I agree with. But I think that, you know, even though he is this mujtahid mutlaq, like we discussed before, 
um, he, all of his rulings coincide with the Vahiri Madhab. And this is a further example that he is rejecting Qiyas here. And that's the first like opening point that he makes in his Usul Fiqh chapter. So he's telling everybody who reads this, I'm Vahiri. And if you go to older Usul Fiqh books that predate Ibn Arabi's time, they all mention that the Vahiris reject Qiyas. So this is something that is well known, and anybody who would read this would automatically know that Ibn Arabi is a Vahiri, and he is trying to show you in your face, I'm a Vahiri. So there's no hiding or go, speaking around things or sugarcoating things. Ibn Arabi is being pretty blunt here. And so on the next page, on 189, he says, وَلَمَّا كَانَ الشَّرْعِ اللَّهِ وَحُكْمُهُ فِي حَرَكَاتِ الْإِنسَانِ الْمُكَلَّفِ لَا يُؤْخِذُ إِلَّا مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ كَذَلِكَ لَمْ تُجَدْ إِلَّا بِالْمُكْتَكَلَّمِ بِهِ وَهُوَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فَقَالَ لِشَيْءٍ كُنْ فَكَانَ فَالْقُرْآنِ أَقْوِيَ الدَّلِيلِ يَسْتَنَدُ إِلَيْهِ أو ما صح عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الذي قام الدليل على صدقه أنه مخبر عن الله جميع ما شرعه في عباد الله وقد يكون ذلك الخبر إما بالإجماع من الصحابة وهو الإجماع أو من بعضهم بنقل عادل عن عادل وهو خبر الواحد وبأي طريق وصل إلينا فنحن متعبدون بالعمل به بلا خلاف بين علماء الإسلام ولهذا يقول أهل الأصول في الإجماع إنه لا بد أن يستند إلا النص وإن لم ينتق به وأما القياس فالمختلف الاتخاذه دليل وأصلا فإن له وجه في المعقول So basically what Ibn Arabi is saying here is when there was the shara of Allah and uh, his ruling or his judgment and the movement of people, the responsible people. Uh, they did not take except the Qur'an. And likewise, you did not find except that Allah was the speaker. And he would say, be and it was. And the Qur'an is the strongest evidence that we derive from. Or what came from the Prophet Muhammad in a sound chain of narration, that which stands as a proof or establishes a proof from his truthfulness. And definitely he was an uh, informant on Allah, everything that he legislated in worshiping Allah. Okay. And. Definitely, that is a khabar or a reported thing. Uh, just the same as ijma, men uh, from the Sahaba, the companions, and that is a consensus, or from some of them narrating a just person on a just person, someone who's upstanding from an upstanding person. And that they call Khabr al-Wahid. Okay, that is a hadith that has like one chain of narration. Or it is not mutawata. It is not mashhur. Mashhur means it has at least three chains of narration. Okay, some of them they would call that Khabr al-Ahad. Um, or you could make call it Khabr al-Wahid. There's some disagreement there. And whatever way that it came to us, we base our, our worship, 
through deeds, like praxis, through it, without disagreement from the scholars of Islam. So basically, all these aforementioned uh, evidences here, they are agreed upon that the ulama, the scholars, will use these as a basis for Islamic law and ethics. That all of these things here are definitive proofs of what we should do as Muslims, what our worship should be, what our character and manner should be. These are all evidence that everybody accepts. And so here he's establishing the clear epistemology of Islamic law in general. Uh, and so here again, Ibn Arabi is trying to show you, I know where people agree and where they disagree. I have a holistic view of the religion. I could see you know, what's core and essential to the religion and what things people disagree about, what things are acceptable disagreements. And it's establishing uh, not only epistemology, but orthodoxy, and or rather orthopraxy. Okay. And then he says, the part in, in uh, pink here, as for uh, analogy, there is difference in whether we accept it as a piece of, as a foundational piece of evidence because it is an aspect of rationality. Here the word that's used is ma'qul, meaning that it's something that's been rationalized. In other words, it's from human rational effort. And therefore, in the Zahri view, it's fallible. It's not a piece of evidence like a text. Here he's, he says, La budda an yustanida illa nasan. Okay, so there's no alternative except that we derive from a text. Okay, so, you know, Ibn Arabi is trying to establish that Islamic law is based in textuality. And that there is another very strong indicative that he is Zahiri. Because a similar thing can be found in like, uh, uh, you know, Ihkamul Usul from Ibn Hazm. So this is something that is very Zahiri in manner. And it's not something that you know you find in any other madhab. Okay. But these things are discussed in every Usul fiqh book of every madhab. Okay you will see that Zahiris are mentioned as a contrast. But Zahiris have always been very small numbers, much like Hanbalis. Okay? So they're not something that people discuss as a social phenomenon, but more as a contrast to highlight differences in epistemology. And that's really interesting here because with Ibn Arabi, he is saying, this is the standard kind of way of doing things, but that's not what I do. And he's highlighting there is valid difference of opinion in regards to Qiyas in Ijtihad. Okay. So this is not something that everybody accepts. And there's you get the sense that he is really trying to push back against the dominant uh, mentality that's out there with Sunni Muslims. And here, you know, given his socio-political context, he's pushing back against these Maliki philosopher jurists who control things politically. You know, they control, uh, I guess you would say, a lot of religious authority as well. Uh, they're the ones that are uh, probably influential to most of the lay people. And so Ibn Arabi is pushing back at this notion. And he, you know, is writing this outside of Andalusia. That's important to remember, too. He's also addressing the Muslim ummah at large. And he's trying to say here, not everything is clear-cut all the time. There is difference of opinion. And you have to respect the difference of opinion, even if it's a small group like the Zahiris or the Hanbalis. The Hanbalis did later on accept Qiyas. They did not at first. So that's an important point I want to add there. On page 196 here, we 
see a discussion that Ibn Arabi is having about uh, Qiyas. And he, you know, has this discussion where he basically says that uh, Qiyas is just something uh, that is from the, you know, human rationality. It's, uh, you know, infallible. I mean, it's fallible. Um, it's, you know, it's not infallible. Um, it, it can sometimes be whimsical. And he is basically saying that if there was something Allah wanted us to know uh, necessarily, that it, we would find it, you know, in a clear text. We would find it in the Quran or in, a, you know, sound narration from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And so, you know, one of the things that he says is he says, well, qiyasu nadhrun aqliyun. So qiyas is just like uh, rational speculation. Ma wajadna laha dhikran fi kitab wa la sunna wa la ijma'. So he's saying, we, here's the, the, the pronoun of we, we do not find any mention of it in the Qur'an, not in the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and not in uh, Ijma', not in the consensus of the companions, or, you know, those of the pious Salaf, upright Salaf, first three generations of Muslims. And so, to me, that's also an indication he rejects uh, the Hadith that does mention uh, Qiyas, the Hadith uh, from Yemen, which I can... Uh, put here in a text. So this is the hadith that's known as a hadith of ijtihad or qiyas. It's interpreted to mean a proof for qiyas, for making these, you know, analogical deductions here. So I'll read it to you in Arabic. حدثنا هناد حدثنا وكيع عن شعبة عن أبي عون الثقفي عن حارث بن عامر عن رجال من أصحاب معاذ عن معاذ عن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم بعث معاذ إلى يمن فقال كيف تقضي فقال أقضي بما في كتاب الله قال فإن لم تكن في كتاب الله قال فبسنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال فإن لم يكن في سنة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال أجتهد رأي قال الحمد لله الذي وفق رسول رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم. So basically, it's uh, saying here that it's narrated from Muadh that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him sent Mu'adh to Yemen and said, how are you going to judge? And so Mu'adh said, I'll judge what, with what I find in the book of Allah. And he said, well, what if you don't find anything in the book of Allah? He said, well, then by the praxis, the uh, sound example of the Prophet Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, he said, well, what if you don't find it in there either? And then he basically says, then I'm going to exert my rationality in making my own uh, opinion, my own judgment here. Ra'i. And the Prophet said, Praise be to God who gave providence to the messenger of the messenger of God, meaning Mu'adh, peace be upon him. Okay. So this is a hadith that uh, most of the ulama, they'll cite in evidence of Qiyas, where it says, Ajtahidu ra'i. So I, you know, use my legal reasoning here, my own discretion. And they say that's a proof for Qiyas. Ibn Arabi, maybe he uh, interprets this hadith differently. Maybe he rejects it. It is da'if, which means that likely the Prophet Muhammad said it, but it's not, you know, that strong. It's not that reliable. So here Ibn Arabi he says, فَهَذَا مَذْهَبُنَا فِي هَذَهِ مَسْأَلَتِي So he says, this is our madhab. So here's the same we, us, our. He says, this is our madhab regarding this issue, meaning qiyas. So he's saying that we 
we don't accept qiyas, you know, when you try to, how does qiyas work, this, uh, uh, how does qiyas work, it's this analogy used for Islamic jurisprudence, let's use marijuana as an example, alcohol, especially wine, wine in particular, is mentioned in the Quran as being forbidden, khamr, meaning fermented grapes, and then, there is a hadith that says anything intoxicating is khamr and therefore forbidden, more or less. That's what the hadith says. I'm paraphrasing here. And so if we say, okay, so anything that makes you drunk, like fermented grapes, is also forbidden. Therefore, fermented wheat in the form of beer is forbidden. Um, you might say fermented... Uh, dates is going to be forbidden that's you know because it intoxicates or you know you might say marijuana it intoxicates therefore it's forbidden and that is how qiyas works and an illa is where you're finding the reasoning why there is a ruling the reason behind the ruling so the reason behind the re you know behind the fact that uh, fermented grapes is forbidden to drink is because it intoxicates and that's the ruling, or I mean, that's the uh, illa, the the rational basis of the ruling, and they figure out the illa through rationality, through logical deduction, induction, or whatever you want to call it, istiqra in Arabic. They're deducing, okay, this is what this must mean, um, given the circumstances here. This is what it. This is why it's haram. And so anything that matches that same criteria, they're going to apply it more broadly. So, you know, alcohol is forbidden because it intoxicates. Therefore, marijuana is forbidden because it also intoxicates. Okay. And so what, what Ibn Arabi is saying is, is this is just human logic that's, that's uh, fallible here. It's, there's no guarantee that that's the real reason behind the ruling. There's just a high probability or some sort of probability could even be low probability. It's not absolute certainty. And he's saying if there was something that was absolutely necessary for us to know. And this was a, a aim, you know, a, a maqsood of the lawgiver, meaning Allah, you know, maqsood al shara, then you know, this is something that would have been told to us through some text. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would have told us directly instead of us trying to use our minds in this willy-nilly, whimsical way. And so Ibn Arabi says, فَهَذَا مَذْهَبُنَا فِي هَذِهِ مَسْأَلَةً That we reject qiyas. He says, أَنَا لَا نَقُولْ بِالْقِيَاسِ بِالنَّظْرِ إِلَيْنَا وَنَقُولْ بِهِ بِالنَّظْرِ لمن أداه إليه اجتهاده لكون الشارع. so he, here he's saying أنا لا نقول بالقياس. so I don't say with قياس. I don't use قياس. all right. and you know he quotes a, a Quranic verse here. نو الله يقول الحق وهو يهدي الصبيلة. So Allah says the truth, the reality, and he guides to the path. He guides to the straight path or the right way. So why don't we just take his word for it? That's kind of what Ibn Arabi is trying to say here. I'm paraphrasing, um, and this is my you know humble, weak understanding here. But this is just more clear evidence that Ibn Arabi is vahiri. So what we find here in this section here on page 192 is there's a quote that I mentioned earlier in the video that I used in my article with taqlid fi din Allahi la yajuz 'andana la taqlid hayya wal mayit wa la mayit So he, you know Ibn Arabi is saying uh, taqlid in the religion of Allah is not accepted amongst us here's this us again uh, meaning a uh, Zahiri Madhab. And there is no taqlid of the living or the dead. 
And he goes on to say a little bit below that there, he says, وَكُلُّ مَسْكُوتٌ عَنْهُ فَلَا حُكُمْ فِيهِ إِلَّا الْإِبَاحَ الْأَصْلِيَّةِ So here, he's saying, everything that Allah is silent about, everything that is uh, omitted from the law, from a text, you know, from the Qur'an, Sunnah, Jama' that is mentioned, there is no ruling upon it except al ibahe al asliye except that it is neutral in its foundation or its original state there the original ruling here is that this object is permissible ibaha mubah it means that it's neutral it's not halal it's not haram uh, well it is halal but it's not uh, like mandatory i mean wajib it's not fard it's not haram it's not makruh it's not mandub or mustahab it is neutral mubah okay so those are the different uh, gradations in islamic ethics you have something that's mandatory you have something that is recommended or preferred and then you have something that is neutral, that is allowable. You have something that's disliked. And then you have something that is completely forbidden. And so here he's saying everything that's not mentioned explicitly in a text is allowable. Okay. So how we mentioned before how the, the Ahl al-Qiyas, the people of Qiyas, they will go on and say that you know, every intoxicant is forbidden because uh, the reason alcohol is forbidden is it's an intoxicant. Every intoxicant is forbidden, so marijuana intoxicates, therefore it's forbidden. The Zahiris would say no. Marijuana is not explicitly mentioned in the Quran. It's not in the Hadith literature. It's not narrated anything about it from the companions or the, the early generations of Muslims, the Salaf. Therefore, it's allowable. It's mubah. And so this is what really makes Zahiri stand out from every other madhab. Okay? This rejection of Qiyas, and Ibn Arabi says it so explicitly so many times, is the hallmark, the mainstay, the cornerstone of the Zahiris. And it's for all of these reasons that I've mentioned here why I'm absolutely convinced that Ibn Arabi is from the Zahiri Madhab. That's his legal epistemology. I mean, he couldn't make it more clear for us. And so that is basically the conclusion of my evidences here. Um, I hope you found them as convincing as I did. If you did not, I'd love to hear reasons why you don't think Ibn Arabi is a Zahiri. I'd love to hear, you know, details below in the comments. Um, you can message the Facebook page. You can reach out to me through Patreon. Please support me with Patreon. It's a lot of uh, editing and work and time that goes into these videos. And, uh, you know, some help for Patreon would allow me to make more content for you guys. Feel free to let me know what type of content you want to see in the future. And thank you very much for watching and listening here to this YouTube video. I love you all very much. Thanks again. <laughs> كل